Hey there, and welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor Josh, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. Let's jump right in. We are in a series called Emojins. We're talking about emotions. The idea behind the series is this. You cannot be spiritually healthy without being emotionally healthy. There's a lot of people who think that they're spiritual, but they're an emotional wreck, and it, just, it, it can't happen. It, a lot of it's fake. Uh, we're going to talk about this later in the month. Emotionalism versus spiritualism, because they look very close. Look very similar. If you've ever been to a Pentecostal church throughout your life, 90% of what we said is the Holy Ghost wasn't the Holy Ghost at all. A lot of it was emotion, and we want to talk about that. But as we begin today, I want to try something brand new. If you could, for like two seconds, give me like a big smile. Even like dip the mask for one second, smile, big smile, at least smile with your eyes, big smile. Yeah, all right, good. Smile. If you're watching online, smile. We may have to revisit that in a minute, because today we're going to talk about the emotion of anger, the emotion of anger. Have you ever been touched with the emotion of anger? Anybody in the room or online today? Yeah? Um, I'm an Enneagram 8. Um, I like to study Enneagram. I like to study personality types. I'm a, uh, my color is red. I'm a chloric. I'm an A type. If you've studied any of this kind of stuff, I'm a D on the disc assessment. Uh, but my Enneagram number is an eight. And Enneagram numbers eight, nine, and one are part of something called the anger triad. Okay, the anger triad means that your go-to emotion when stressed is anger. So Enneagram eight, they're kind of like the, uh, they're kind of like the driving types or whatever. Enneagram nine is the peacemaker. They're kind of like all go with the flow until they're not. And then that'll come out. And then Enneagram 1, they're like very detailed, very systematic. Uh, they try to find a perfect world, but because the world isn't perfect, they're just angry that the world isn't perfect. So anyway, anger is something very real to me. It's something that I've had to deal with my entire life. It, it, it had become very easy for me to lead with anger uh, because it would scare people and manipulate them to get what I wanted out of them. Anybody in the room? Okay, so... So that you don't feel attacked, I'm coming from my own deficiency, not yours today, but I believe that we can be healthier in our relationships and how we correspond with each other. So here's the question today. Is it a sin to be angry? Hopefully you don't have any anger issues, the person who just quickly said no, and then you just told your family, shut up, no it's not. <laughs> Is it a sin to be angry? Show me the angry face. Have you ever sent this emoji to somebody? Would you send this emoji to your spouse if she just said, I was on my way to church, I slid, hit a curb, bent the rim on the car? You sending that emoji? I am! <laughs> I cannot stand curb rash on people's rims. I'm like, I look at people's rims all the time, I, you know how to drive. Most of those curb rashes happen at the, drive, at the fast food drive through just so you know, trying to get close to the window. What would you send the, 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 the angry emoji for? Would you send the angry emoji, I lost my check card at Walmart and somebody charged $500 to it? Would you send an angry emoji to that? Is there anything that would make you send an angry emoji? You lying. <laughs> Is God angry at me if I get angry? That one wasn't as bold. Is God angry at me if I get angry? Okay. So let me just settle it once and for all. It is not a sin to be angry. Okay? It is not a sin to be angry. But, big but, anger can very quickly lead to unproductive and very destructive sin. It can go to sin. But the emotion of anger in and of itself isn't a sin unless 
it leads you to do something that is wrong, like punch somebody in the face. That's going too far, right? That's where that anger came out and you responded in an incorrect way. I think you'd probably agree that there's a lot of sinful anger in the world today. Just watch, I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I do not encourage this app whatsoever. You will waste hours of your life on TikTok. But there's fist fights all over TikTok. People fight all the time. Right? Fist fighting. You can see there is a lot of sinful anger in the world. Just scroll through social media and just, oh, just, I just dare you. I dare you to type whatever political party you are and hit send to all your friends on Facebook. Watch how fast you start an argument and anger comes out. You're a liberal. You're a conservative. Come on, somebody. Anger. Anger. Ephesians 4, 26, the apostle Paul is writing to us, and he makes it very clear, and he says these words, in your anger do not sin. So just from there we can see that he's saying, you are going to get angry. It is assumed that anger is going to come. So in your anger, when anger comes, do not sin, ready? Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. So there's three parts to this. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. I will say this. Uh, My wife and I have made it a practice that we do not go to bed angry. We do not go, we do not fall, uh, no, I'm sorry, let me back that up. We, We, yes, we will go to bed angry. We will not fall asleep angry at each other. We will lay there or sit up or whatever it is in the room and talk that thing out until we come to some sort of solution where I'm not afraid that she's going to choke me out in the middle of the night. (laughs) It's really self-preservation, really. No, we take this verse very seriously that I don't want to lay there and listen, you know too. You're upset at that person. You can feel that they're upset at you. So you lay there pretending you're asleep with your eyes closed just to annoy them. But you're really thinking about how mad you are at them and how you're working on that. And you're losing all this sleep anyway instead of just resolving the situation. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath. It's telling you don't harbor bitterness Don't hold on to something for hours and hours and hours. Don't hold on to bitterness. Don't hold on to unforgiveness. The Bible tells us that bitterness or unforgiveness is as rottenness as to the bone. I will tell you a lot of people that I have spoken to that have a cancer in their body, as I really talk to them, they harbor some sort of unforgiveness and bitterness towards somebody. Coincidence? I don't know. But the Bible warns it. The Bible, and it's not a warning against you like, okay, yeah, God's going to get you. No, no, no. It's telling you, listen, get that out of your life because it's going to eat you up. It's as rottenness as to the bone. Do not harbor bitterness. Do not harbor unforgiveness. Man, be quick to forgive. Be quick to forgive. Be quick to get it out of your life. Don't let the devil, I mean, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And then number three, it says, don't give the foothold to the devil. The Greek word here, foothold, it means to give a place or to make room or to give room to the enemy in your life. It's like trying to keep the cold out of your house, but you have the door propped open. Huh? Ah, we don't want any cold weather coming in. We got the heat on, but the door's wide open. It's like, don't leave the door open. And, and I wonder if this could be the reason why a lot of marriages are struggling. It's because you've got the door left open for the enemy in your life. You got some things that have happened over the years. You've been in a relationship for a long time. And there's some hurts. There's some woundings. And, and, and you bring it up. Every time there's a disagreement, you bring that thing up. And what it does is it it leaves this door open for more and more hurt and more and more pain for the enemy to bring into your life. Close the door on anger. Close the door on anger. Close the door on anger. Now listen, you're talking to somebody who is professional at anger. I can remember as a kid my parents saying to me stuff like, 
why are you so angry? Like, you're just a kid. Why are you so angry? Where does anger come from? And then even as an adult, I was, I was a professional at anger. I could get so angry and get so, you know, loud and so aggressive, everybody would shut down. They'd all shut down. I'd get in my way. Manipulate the situation just by getting loud and getting angry. And it was funny because the more I'd get loud and angry and everybody shut down, then I'd get mad that they shut down. <laughs> but I realized they didn't want to get hurt. They didn't want me to say more things that were hurtful because I realized that the arguments that I was getting in, the disagreements that I was getting in, I wasn't trying to solve them. I was trying to win. Can I help somebody today? The point of a disagreement is not to win. It's to resolve the disagreement. It's to come to a solution. Do you know what I realized in my marriage is that we weren't on the same team. I was on team Mike, she was on team Cindy. And so we got into a fight, team Mike wanted to win and whatever it cost to beat team Cindy. But it wasn't McKelvey's trying to win. It wasn't McKelvey's trying to solve a problem. It wasn't McKelvey's trying to come up with a solution so that we could move life forward. We could move our relationship forward. We could move raising our kids forward. It was me getting my way against her getting her way. And she's an Enneagram 9. I'm an Enneagram 8. We're both in the anger triad. So let me tell you, we had some doozies. We had some good ones, man. You could also say it like this. I'm Irish. She's Puerto Rican. Both fighters, man. Fighters, that mean? Hala Mashanda, hey. <laughs> but there's a story in the Bible where Jesus demonstrates something out of character for him. Jesus steps into a moment of anger, which is out of character for him. It's not like him to behave this way, and we're not trying to be biblically codependent. We're not giving Jesus a reason to act angry, but we need to look at some of the situations surrounding his outburst. Right before Jesus enters Jerusalem, it's a time of Passover, and if you don't know what Passover is, it's essentially every Jew in the Roman Empire travels to Jerusalem for this massive celebration of Passover where they would make sacrifices to God. In fact, the historian uh, Josephus says that there might be 40,000 extra people that travel into this area during that time. There'd be a quarter of a million people or so in Jerusalem just for this Passover. Beyond all these people coming to Jerusalem, it is also the last week of Jesus' life, and he knows it. He knows it. He knows he's going to die this week. Like in five days, he's going to give his life. So if he's a little bit uptight, we could give him some slack, can't we? Like he's a human being knowing he's going to die. He's also fully God knowing that he's going to be separated from the Father for the first time in all of eternity. We've got to suggest that he was a little on edge, justifiably. But we know that he steps into a little bit of anger, but we also know that he did not sin because the moment Jesus is guilty of a sin, he no longer is the spotless lamb of God that can take away the sin of the world. So we have to surround and, and, and have this knowledge of knowing Jesus is about to act in a way that is uncharacteristic of him. It is not ordinary for Jesus to act in anything like righteous anger. But he does. He steps into righteous anger, not sinful anger, righteous anger. And the Bible says he flips the tables over, flips tables of what he called money changers. Money changers. And now, it's all, and now there was nothing wrong with money changers. And it was fine. It's like if you're traveling to another country and you have dollars, but then you need another sort of money, you go to a currency exchange. And they exchange your currency, but there's a fee that they charge. And that's fine. That's normal. That's business, right? But because there's 40,000 extra people, they raise the rates. They raise rates. We can make a lot of money now. 
Not only that, they're selling doves. They're selling doves outside for sacrifice so that people can come in and make a sacrifice to the Lord, which is just. This is right. But a normal dove costs about $2, let's say. But there's 40,000 extra people. We can make a lot of money. So let's raise the price to $50 a dove. What this does, what this does is it absolutely makes it impossible for the poor and the marginalized to worship God. It makes it a middle, upper class only access to God. That's what set Jesus off. That's what set Jesus off. He says to them, overturning the tables, he says, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it into a den of robbers. Let's look at this today. You buy three Giants tickets, right? You're going to go to a Giants game. But your brother, your friend says, yo, I want to go with you. You need a fourth ticket. So instead of buying it online or whatever, you're like, I'll just get one when we get to the stadium. So you're walking up to the stadium, and this guy's like, yo, 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 I got tickets, I got tickets. So he's scalping them. You say, yo, man, how much for these tickets? He's like, $700. $700? These tickets are 100 bucks. Yeah, but you're not buying them online. You're buying them from me. And you say to yourself, this is highway... Jesus coined the phrase right there. You're not going to make my father's house a den of robbers. You're robbing people. You're robbing them of their finances, and you're robbing them of the ability to present a sacrifice to the Lord. But then, so Jesus does it. He flips the tables. He, 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 he speaks to people, and then something happens that just doesn't even make any sense. Watch this. The very next verse, it says, the blind and the lame came to see him at the temple and he healed them. That's the very next verse. He flips the table. He says, this will be a house of prayer. You're not turning it into a den of thieves, den of robbers. And then the blind and the lame were there and he healed them. And it's a little weird sentence because he's like combining these two stories. Jesus is righteously angry. He's showing them where they're wrong. He's showing an unusual expression of himself. And he's healing people at the same time. I promise you, if Jesus was in sin, I, he wouldn't have been healing. I just don't think he would have. I think his mind would have been on things of the flesh and not things of the spirit. I think that he stayed righteous. I think that he stayed holy in dealing with what he was dealing with. Here's what we know. Jesus was not characterized by his anger. Nowhere in, their Bible, nowhere in your Bible does it say that Jesus was known by his anger. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, yo, we love Jesus, but just don't push his buttons. It never says Jesus was mostly found calm, but sometimes angry. No one had to walk on eggshells around him. No one said, man, when Jesus is healthy, I love being around him. But man, he's got like these moments that are just so dark and they scare me sometimes. Shame on any of us having to be around people like that. Shame on me for being that kind of person. Come on, somebody. We got to be for real. Jesus was never characterized as somebody with anger. He didn't get angry. Except maybe this one time, we don't know. What we do know about Jesus is that he was known for his love and not his anger. Jesus was known for his love, not his anger. When people think of Jesus, they first think a loving and caring God. He loved the outcast. He touched the leper. He forgave the sinner. He rose the dead. He created a community for people who were not worthy of God. And he made a way for them to access God. I wonder if in our own lives, if people would characterize us as being ones full of love. I wonder if people at your job say 
about you, when they talk about you, when they write birthday cards and Christmas cards, that person loves so much. They have such a big heart. I wonder if those are the things that people say. Or I wonder if it's the other side. We're like, man, you know, they, they're so good. If they just weren't so angry, if they just weren't so neurotic, if they weren't so given to such negative emotion, like they'd be so great if they just didn't talk about so many negative things. If they dealt with anger. So there's some things I want to show you today. The first thing that we're going to see about Jesus' anger is this. Jesus wasn't angry about what others did to him, but Jesus was angry on behalf of those who were being mistreated. Here's what I know about us. Most of us get angry when we don't get our way. Don't shout your parents out. Don't don't shout them out. But the time that your parents get mad at you, right, that you feel that they're angry at you, is when they tell you to do something, you don't do it, right? Right? And they're like, I told you 900 times to go clean, right? And it's because you didn't do it. And so parents feel justified in getting angry at their kids because they didn't do what I told them to do. You're right. They didn't. But just because a child didn't do what you told them to do doesn't mean that you have to get angry about it. I'm alone, I'm alone with myself right now. I know I feel it. I feel it. I'm preaching to me right now. <laughs> Just because someone doesn't do what you want them to do doesn't mean you have to get angry. You are in control of all of your emotions. You are in control of everything you feel. Just because the dog went potty on the floor doesn't mean you have to get angry about an animal that doesn't even have a brain anywhere near yours and was scratching on the door for the last four hours for you to let him out. But because you didn't want to get up off the couch underneath your Snuggie, I'm going to beat my dog for peeing on the floor. Should know better. Come on, somebody. Come on, we're talking about anger today. And I can can attest this because this is how I live. I didn't think I had an option. I thought I was justified in anger. This is how I am. I'm an A-type, chloric, driven person. I can be angry. And I was realizing that I was just hurting people. Instead of doing what Jesus did, bringing healing and hope and love, I was afflicting wounds. I'm making people codependent. Making people skittish. Didn't want to give feedback. So I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm being, trying to be creative. Hey, give me some feedback. Nobody would give me feedback because they were afraid of my comeback. And what happens is you get very, very lonely in your anger. You're so right You're so right, you're the only one that believes it. And it becomes very, very lonely. Jesus was not offended because someone didn't believe him. Jesus wasn't offended because someone talked about him behind his back. Jesus wasn't offended because he was betrayed. Jesus wasn't offended because he was cheated on by Judas. He was offended He turned the tables. Listen, he turned the tables on a systemic problem. He was standing up for injustice. He was standing up for the systemic problem of making it um, that that, that the, the poor and the marginalized could not afford to worship God. He said, that's not the house that we created. You're telling the one who wrote the book on worship how to be worshiped. This can't happen can't happen. Now, well, you, you, you got to look like, to think to yourself, did Jesus ever have a right to be angry other than this? Absolutely. He was talked about. He was plotted against. He was beat. He was arrested. He had plenty of opportunities to sit back. Well, I didn't even do anything wrong. Look what they're doing to me. But that, he was never angry over that. He was never angry over that. Listen, when you get angry out of something that only serves yourself, 
it's probably sin. When the anger is a righteous anger, when it's standing for injustice, what it's going to do, it's also going to then be solution-minded. It's going to bring a solution. It's going to solve something. It's going to go somewhere. It's going to bring healing. When anger comes out of you and it produces harm, it's not godly. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only that is uplifting to those who hear it. I'm just going to tell you, anytime foul language is accompanied to your anger, you've gone too far. You've gone too far. The moment you start using bad language in an argument, you've already lost because you've run out of vocabulary to solve the situation. You're just trying to win. You're just trying to win. All right? I'm just trying to give a little anger audit to you today. You know, where, are you, where do you range? Is it okay to be angry if somebody really, 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 really hurts you? Maybe for a moment, but don't let the sun set on it. Don't use your anger to cause more pain and punishment. Don't use anger. Here's some good news today. We're not bound to the natural world. We follow a supernatural God who invites us to do something that goes beyond what the natural world does. He, he brings us into a supernatural place. He informs us that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives and dwells on the inside of each and every one of us. And we can't forget that. Let's not forget that we are a spirit, we have a soul, then we live in a body. All right? And we have to think about, how can I forgive those who have wronged me? Believe it or not, how, Pastor Mike, but I want to build this the right way. Pastor Mike, how do I forgive somebody who has really, really hurt me? Like, you don't understand how bad that hurts. Okay? I love when, I love when people think that no one else understands them. That's an Enneagram 4. How do I forgive somebody who's really, really, really hurt me? How do I forgive someone who's lost all my trust? They betrayed me. Ready? You choose to. You choose to. I don't know that you'll ever feel like forgiving somebody. But you choose to. You make a decision. You draw a line in the sand and say, I choose. But Pastor Mike, are you telling me that they don't deserve me to? Oh, they deserve it. That's beside the point. But I have a right to. You do, but that's beside the point. You're choosing to forgive. And when you choose to forgive, you draw a line in the sand and you say, I'm never going back to that side, digging up that information and using it again. It's forgiven, it's buried. When you don't do that, you're harboring this bitterness. You're harboring this unforgiveness. When you get into an argument and immediately you start digging up stuff they did last week, last month, last year, you never, you always, you've stepped into a place that's not godly. It's not, it's not healthy. There's no future living in the past. There's no future arguing in the past. It's dead. Do you love the person enough to free them from the past hurt? From the past mistake? From the past decision? How do I forgive somebody? As a Christian, the only benchmark we have, the only benchmark we have is to understand that we have been forgiven much. Because I have been forgiven, I forgive. Now, there are some people in here who maybe you lived really, really good lives. You, you've been a really good person. You just always have been. You're still guilty. Every single one of us are still guilty of the sin of mankind. 
and that has to be forgiven. The sin of mankind has to be forgiven. And, and that was forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Him who knew no sin, we're talking about Jesus, became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That, that's what happens. We have to understand that in and of myself, I cannot live a perfect life. So I serve the one who did, who gave his life as a ransom. And so... Because of that, I can extend forgiveness to others. You can extend forgiveness to others. I want you to understand that when Jesus got angry, he flipped tables. He never flipped people. He didn't flip them off, and he didn't punch them in the face, right? He never took his anger as a reason to inflict more pain on somebody else. Any sort of anger, if it's going to be righteous, is going to solve a problem. I'm going to say maybe the thing that angers you about the world today, maybe the thing that angers you about society today is the thing that you are called to fix. Maybe if there's something political that bothers you extremely bad, maybe you are called to politics and to raise a standard and to be different. And help fix it. Maybe there's a social injustice. Maybe there's something in your job that you're seeing is broken. Maybe you need to run for an office. Maybe you need to be part of the, 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 the committees that at your job and change the problem. That's how you operate in righteous anger, solution-minded. Not just sitting back and gossip. Not just sitting back and backbiting but stepping in to bring change, life change. Here's what I want you to know today. We're not gonna take things personally. We're gonna be angry on behalf of others. This is the change that we're gonna make in our lives. We're not taking things personally. You can't make me angry. You can't make me angry. Listen, get that. Like, this isn't even, this isn't like even like mind over matter. You can't make me angry. No one can make me angry. No one can hurt your feelings. You choose to respond to what someone is saying in the way that you're responding. The problem is that we're all pre-programmed to respond the same way. But we're going to not take things personally. We're going to be angry on the behalf of others. On behalf of others. That, so when, when I get angry, it's going to be for change. One of my callings, I believe, is to change what church has always been into what God wants it to be today. That's one of my callings. And I, I get angry about certain things that are happening in the church world. I get angry about things that I've allowed to happen in the church world for the change of others. Let me ask you today, is there room for you to grow in this area? Is there room for things to not bother you so much, have attitude so much, be emotional so much? Can we process things? I'll tell you, me and my wife, we we have little facial expressions that we give each other when we think we're getting hot from the kids. We'll give each other this look like, mostly mine's like a hand raise, I'm like, pump the brake. I don't like the tone of that. I don't want the kids learning that tone. Kids will learn your tone. Kids will repeat that tone. Then all of a sudden your kids are talking to you like that. Why are you talking, you think you can talk to me like that? Why wouldn't they? You talk to them like that. Right? This is the cycle. Like, it's a cycle of these things that we work on and we discuss. Now, kids, hear me out. I'm not giving you permission to talk back to your parents and tell them that they're wrong. You're just in here because we close teens today. (laughs) I'm giving your parents tools for things that they're going to work on, that you will see improvement because they didn't have the tools, right? We all believed we were victims to our emotions. We're not. We're not victims to our emotions. We have a personality. That's our personality. We have a way that we are. That's just who we are. Emotions, we can work on. We can work on emotions. Throughout the rest of the month, we're going to look at a few different things 
Uh, in two weeks, we're going to look at emotionalism versus spiritualism. That there are things that have happened in the church world that really weren't God at all. They were just a lot of emotion. And there's a lot of things that looked like it was emotion that God was actually in. We're going to look at some of these things, moving things forward to say, God, how can we worship you? How can we serve you in a sound, consistent way? I've been reading a book. I invite you to read it with me called Emotionally Healthy Spiritually. It is a good book. It's got some stuff in there that I don't particularly agree with, but it may, it may settle with you okay. But all in all, it's a pretty great book about being emotionally and spiritually. And his main catchphrase is this. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. Wild, wild concept. And I love it that we would work on those things in our own lives. Amen? Let's pray today. Father, we come to the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that we would understand what righteous anger would be. We would not try to manipulate our families to say that every time we get angry, it's righteous. But Father, we would be emotionally healthy, that we would follow after the things that you would want in our lives. Help us to let go of the past. Help us to let go of those things that have hurt us. Help us to pursue the joy of the Lord, which will be our strength. Help us to pursue life-giving conversations and environments that bring the best out of us. Help us to have a happy heart. Lord, I thank you and I praise you today. As you protected us getting here today, we are protected on our way home. I thank you that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great weekend watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel, and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.